Good morning. We're all up a little early this morning. I'm sure that Pastor Ron will keep us wide awake, even though we may be yawning. Um, we'll look forward to that. Attendance pads are over here on this side, on the street side. Please sign those and pass them across. Couple reminders. Um, the Journey Through the Bible, the daily Bible study, is still there on the podcast. We kind of forget about that once in a while because it's been ongoing, but don't forget to tune in. The Chosen on Wednesday nights. We had a wonderful turnout on Wednesday night. We've made some adjustments that you'll be happy about. We have closed captioning for this week. Yay. Yeah, that, that was really a bummer. It was kind of hard to understand parts of it, but we've got that all worked out. Closed captioning. We will start right at 6.30, so uh, please be prompt. Uh, I know those of you that are coming from work sometimes have to slip in a little later, but the rest of us can get there so that we're ready to start at 6.30. On March 27th, that's the last Sunday of this month, the Worship at the Park will incorporate a memorial for Rudy Jimenez into their service. So those of you who would like to attend, mark that on your calendars. The 27th, you may want to attend both worship services that day uh, at the park at 11, memorial for Rudy Jimenez. We're taking orders for Easter lilies. It's upon us. Uh, if you would like to purchase a memorial Easter lily, uh, you saw the information in your newsletter. Ruth will be in the fellowship hall after worship. I'll be at the entrance to the church if you're going out that way. Uh, get those orders in. Uh, the deadline, I don't know. You'll have to look in your newsletter. That's how I'll find out. Uh, but it, it will be upon us. And then finally, this week on Tuesday, this is... Um, Finance, Property, and Endowment Committees, 6.30 on Tuesday. Pastor Bob will call us to worship. For our call to worship this morning as we call the church into worship, as a community of faith, I picked a passage that I hope will encourage us during this time. Not only globally, but many people are dealing with sickness um, and COVID and other issues in your life. And so I chose this passage. Excuse me, I took my marker out too soon. Oops. <laughs> In verse 47 of John 6, it says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread I will offer so the world may live is my flesh. What a passage during this time that... God wants us to know he's still there. He hasn't gone anywhere. And he wants to provide what we need as sustenance in our life as we move through the challenges that we face. Amen. Here's a song that says, men of faith, rise up and sing. And then the second verse says, women of the truth, stand and sing. So I guess you better stand as we sing, shout to the north and the south. 
Jesus is Savior to all. One, two, three, four. Men of faith, rise up and sing of the great and glorious King. You are strong when you feel weak in your brokenness complete. Shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west. Jesus is Savior to all. And then sing to broken hearts Who can know the healing power Of our awesome King of love Shout to the north and the south Sing to the east and the west Jesus is Savior to all Lord of heaven and earth Another new song. Well, actually, this was written in the 70s. Maybe some of you have sung it in the past. It's taken from Psalm 57. And there in the psalm, the, the psalmist says, I will awaken the dawn, he says. And he goes on to say, be exalted, O God. Well, maybe the hour you've lost makes you a little sleepy, but here's a song that I trust will wake us up to the truths that uh, God is a God of steadfast love, and we exalt him this morning. <clears throat> Listen, sing along as, as you learn it, if you don't know it already. One. I will give thanks to you, O oh Lord, among the people. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great. Great to the heavens and your faithfulness, your faithfulness to the gods. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory.
times in our lives where we're struck by human evil, <coughs> human evil and this is one of those times some of you can remember of course World War II atrocities and now we're facing similar atrocities in our world in light of that we're going to take up an offering specifically for Ukrainian aid and it's going to be next week so be thinking and praying this week how you'd like to contribute um, we've contacted a Presbyterian missionary who's been uh, part of our Presbytery's uh, support impact teams have gone to God's Hidden Treasures, a woman named Nita Hansen is the director, and she lives in Ukraine, and she specifically is there for disabled people in Ukraine. I was in touch with her by email this week. Here's some of the things she shared. May the whole world flood the throne room of God with our cries for Ukraine. May he, in his great wisdom and mercy, stop the destruction of towns and villages and killing of innocent men, women, and children. 
I am so brokenhearted by the death and devastation in my beloved Ukraine. Pray for wisdom for me as we search for ways to connect with humanitarian aid in Slovakia and other countries. Pray for wisdom for all the other ways God will grant us to help the Ukrainian people. So here's a few pictures she sent. This is, uh, you can see possibly that he's in a wheelchair. They have two vans where they've um, been moving refugees out of Ukraine into neighboring Slovakia, into Poland. And this is one happy man. Here's another young woman who was brought from Ukraine to Slovakia. And uh, you see how they're greeted. They're finally feeling safe and at home after harrowing journeys through war-torn corridors in Ukraine. There's another young man who's been rescued. So the needs are for food, water purification tablets, medications. Here's the van that they use, one of the vans. They have two vans. They're thinking of buying another one. And uh, transporting people out, they get, they get to Slovakia or Poland, they load up with supplies and go back to help people. And uh, the question now is, where do we send them? Where do we send them after they're in Slovakia and Poland? Nita requests prayers. Here's another, I'll close with this. This is Maya and Nick's story, two missionaries in Ukraine. When you're outside of this horror, you're, you can think of peacemaking as a process of pacifying both sides, hoping that it's possible for wolves to be fed and sheep to be safe. Calling this a crisis or a conflict between Russia and Ukraine, what is happening in Ukraine is war. Russian military aggression. What Russians are doing in Mariupol is genocide. They continue bombing the city and not allowing humanitarian corridors to take civilians out. So just as a reminder, t next week, special offering for Ukrainian aid Nita tells us that 100% of our offering will go toward Ukrainian aid. There's no overhead or administrative costs. And as we move to prayer, we will be praying for the people of Ukraine. Thank you. As we go to prayer this morning, obviously the people of the Ukraine need our prayers. Who would pray for the people of Ukraine as they struggle through this incredibly difficult time? Is there someone who would lift them up as we pray? I've got three people. I'm going to start in back. Yvette, thank you. Other prayer requests this morning? Uh, yes, I'd just like to ask for continued prayers for my son, Alan. And uh, he's not doing real well right now. He's not feeling very good. Mm. So I just... Ask that prayers be lifted up for him. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Who will pray for Alan? Thank you, Rod. How else can we be praying for each other or someone close to you? Uh, 
Uh, prayers for Sally Staben. She returned to the hospital yesterday. Who will pray for Sally? Thank you, Val. Okay. Uh, we have a very special nephew named Greg, who isn't doing well, both mentally, physically, and emotionally. And uh, we visited him yesterday, uh, my niece and I, and uh, he kind of shut the door in our face. So Ooh. we're very concerned about his well-being. And sure. so uh, we'd appreciate prayer for Greg. Thank you. Who will pray for Greg? Thank you, Steve. Any other requests? We don't want to miss if there's someone you would like prayer for or yourself. Then let's go to prayer. And after the folks that you offered to pray for, I will end in prayer. Please raise your hand and the mic will come to you if you offer to pray for someone. Let's pray. Well, we pray specifically for Greg, Lynn and Judy's nephew. So many struggle with mental illness these days and These people often don't know how to relate to the world around them. And uh, it's very often the case we don't know how to help. Mm -hmm. But Father, you know their needs. You know specifically what Greg is going through. And yes. I pray that he'll somehow sense your love, the love of his family, especially mm -hmm. Lynn and Judy, Thank you. as they attempt to reach out to him. And as always, Father, we pray for healing. Mm. Touch Greg in a special way with your healing hand. In Jesus' name, Come, Lord. amen. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we come to you with gratitude for the knowledge that you love us and you care for us in every detail of our lives. We ask, Father, that you would be with Sally in particular, mm -hmm. yes, that God. you would be with Laura and the whole family as they are so concerned about her health. Mm -hmm. Father, we'd ask that your healing hand come upon her and that you would bring her back to good health again. Mm -hmm. She needs your strength. Father, because she is so weak. We thank you, Father, for the knowledge that we can come to you in prayer and that you hear us. We ask you to watch over all of us, Father, and keep us in your hands. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. God, we know you are a merciful God, faithful and abounding in love. Mm. And we lift up the Ukrainian people to you today, Lord, and all of the people who are helping to remove people from, from this horrible situation. We ask for your love and your protection around them and all of the aid workers and all of the, uh, the military that is helping mm. to try to crush the, the, the Russian invasion. Lord, we ask you to, in, to intervene at this time mm -hmm. and, and bring a stop to, the, to these atrocities. We know that you know, we can't see all the plan you have, Lord, but we know that everything, you will work out for good. But we are asking especially, Lord, now to we bring these people to you because they need your mercy and they need your love. Yes. And in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Father, we also lift up to you today, Alan, who is struggling with uh, lack of hope. And Lord, we just ask that you would lead someone to him or uh, show him your love, that he can have that 
hope that comes through a personal relationship with you, that he can see the love and the care that you have for him, and that he will uh, have the joy of knowing you personally, mm-hmm. and that you will uh, comfort him and, and address the needs that he has. And Lord, we also lift up Shirley uh, as she struggles with how to uh, deal with all of this. And uh, just give her the comfort knowing that it's all in your hands, Lord, and to trust in you. Whatever happens, you are God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Father God, along with the prayers of Yvette and those that are silent, prayers for the Ukraine, Lord, we pray your hedge of protection around the people of the Ukrainian people, Lord. We pray that you would protect them from the evil invasion of their country. May they get to safety so that they can live um, fearless in the midst of a situation that would cause anyone to fear. Lord, we lift up all the requests that have been mentioned and that have been prayed for this morning. And Lord, we pray that all these things would come to you through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for giving us a model of prayer through Jesus. And we conclude our time of prayer this morning as a community, praying as he has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading today is James, the second chapter, verses 14 through 26. Faith without works is dead. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them things that are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God You do well. Even demons believe, and they tremble. But you do not want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. Thank you for the Lord's word. 
to this point in James, James has asked his readers to do things that only somebody who has been made alive to God and has genuine living faith can do. Let's do a quick, a quick rehearsal of what some of the things James has suggested to his readers. He says, one, when you're going through hard times of any sort, pray. And God will give you direction. He'll give you a GPS. But have a single heart, a heart really that intends to obey God, not a double-minded heart that's in love with this world and spotted by this world. And then he says, go back to the Word of God. Instead of getting offended by your hard times, go to the Word of God because the Word of God shows us God's original intention. That before the world began, he chose to make you alive by the Word of God. He says, be a doer of that Word. And not a hear only. Don't look into the mirror or the word and then ignore it and deceive yourselves. And then he says, avoid classism. Don't treat rich people better than poor people. And observe the royal law that sets you free, which is to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. And such a law sets you free from the enslavery of self. Heeding Jesus' word. You will love the Lord your God and all your, with all your heart and your neighbor as itself. So he realizes he's asked these folks to do things like persevere, grow up in the faith till their faith is teleos, that only someone who's alive to God, not dead to God, can do. And just in case there's someone in the crowd, and there's always someone in the crowd, says, well, thank you for your spiritual advice, James. And then they kind of shelf it. He writes them this to let them know that even though they have a confessed faith, because all these people have a professed faith, he's writing to Christians. And he knows that even in the crowd of folks that have a professed faith, there's going to be people in there that don't have a genuine faith, a faith that is alive. And so he writes to that situation. The Apostle Paul, when he speaks of faith, he speaks of it in a different way. Because he's speaking to, the, to people who feel observing Torah and the law is, how, is what makes you a child of God. James is talking to Christians who have a Jewish background, but they've all made a profession of faith. And so he wants them to examine what faith really is. Instead of crying out the mantra, I'm saved by grace through faith alone, he wants them to examine what is that faith alone that justifies And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at what faith does. Most of the time, when you think about faith, people like to talk about it in in this way. What does faith believe? But for James, what does faith do is just as important than what faith believes or what faith agrees with. And hence, I've titled this, What Does Faith Do? Genuine Faith. First, Let's look at verse 14. Here is this question. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says or someone claims, someone who professes, I have faith, I believe Jesus is my Savior, I believe in the Trinity, but has no deeds or works or actions? Can such faith save them? And that's the question. Does a a faith... Can that kind of faith that has no corresponding actions, that faith alone, save? And so he brings out three different types of faith, and he's asking the question, can this faith alone save you? And the first faith he brings under trial is dead faith. Can dead faith save us? What is dead faith? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, be well fed, but do nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? So you might bless someone like peace, go in peace, but you do nothing. There's nothing profitable about that. And he says in the same way, having dead faith will do nothing for you. Just like just blessing somebody who's hungry doesn't do anything good for them or profitable if you don't actually give them food. So a dead faith won't produce any salvific results for us. He says, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, it is dead. So, there there was a church mantra 
that started coming around the 14th century. And it was sola fide, faith alone. That's a beautiful, beautiful mantra. We are saved by trusting in Jesus alone. We are saved by grace, actually, through faith alone. Would it be right, then, to say sola fide necros? Sola fide necros, the translation in English would be saved by dead faith alone. Would that be a viable mantra? No. So that's what he's asking. Can you really say that? I'm saved by my dead faith alone. Hallelujah. (laughs) Well, there's no hallelujah to shout if you're saved by dead faith alone because dead faith does not save. Dead faith agrees in the mind that certain things are true. It pays lip service, but there's no power. It's like saying, I have a car. Oh, let's pop the hood of that bad sucker. There's no engine in there. So a car is useless with no engine. And God might think it's great that you believe the right things, believe orthodox doctrine, know the Bible, but with no engine in the car, living genuine faith, it's useless. Number two, can demonic faith save? And demonic faith is kind of a funny title because it actually can be a biblical faith. Remember in the Gospels, the devil shows up to Jesus as he was being tempted 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. And the, nev- the devil knew scripture, even obscure scripture. And he said, Psalm 91, Jesus says that if the Messiah falls off the mountain, that God will give his angels charge over you so that you don't dash your foot against a stone. And the only reason the devil could test, the, uh, twist the truth is that we know the devil twists the truth. The only reason he could do it is because he knows the truth. And so the devil is very orthodox. He'd get a PhD at the seminary. He would know how to answer all the questions correctly. And that's why he's a master of twisting the truth, because he knows the truth. And so someone could be catechized or disciple and know all the genuine doctrines and agree. And James says, you do well. That's important to know truth. It's super important to have truth right, the truth of the gospel, essential. But he says, you've only climbed half of the ladder at that point. Because even the demons, the devil's minions, know the, know the truth. They know that Jesus is the Son of God. Remember in the gospels, the demons would say, Son of God, have you come here to torment us? They even know doctrines of eternal perdition. Are you going to torment us before the time? They know eschatology, the doctrine of end things. But what do demons lack? They don't love God, and they don't obey God or serve him. And so simply agreeing with the Bible and agreeing with orthodox, correct, wholesome teaching is not enough because demons agree and believe wholesome, orthodox teaching. But they don't love God. They don't see beauty in God. They're not enthralled with God, and they certainly don't serve God. And so to have faith that knows all the right things, Jesus is my Savior, God has existed in three distinct eternal persons of Trinity, and to have everything right, but not to have the living force of faith by the Holy Spirit that loves God, that's enthralled, that's in awe of God, we've only climbed the ladder of saving faith halfway. And so would it be right to say, See, how would I translate that in the Latin? Sola fide demonios. <laughs> I'm saved by demonic faith alone. That would not fly as a mantra either. So you can't say, I'm saved by dead faith alone, and you can't have a mantra, I'm saved by demonic faith alone. One last type of faith before we talk about genuine faith. Can useless faith save? untested, unproven faith, faith that has not been stretched or shown to be genuine. He says, you foolish, empty person, that Greek word for empty is kenosis, empty. It might be a hint to being empty of the Holy Spirit. That's just my personal opinion. You empty person, do you want evidence of faith without deeds is useless. 
But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds or action or, or works, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. What's James doing? In modern vernacular, people say, show me the money. We're talking business. Show me the clams. Recently, I've sold a trailer. Like People always want to talk. Show me the money. Then we'll talk. Or when you go buy a house, show me the pre-approval letter. Right? Show me, show me the money. Show me the beef. Remember that little cute lady? Show me the beef. That's what James is saying. Okay, you say you have faith. Show it to me. Show it to me. Or I have a Porsche or Maserati. Show me. It goes 80 degrees. I mean, 80 miles an hour in six seconds. Show me that that's a Maserati. Jesus modeled that for us. God in the flesh. He showed us that his baptism was real. The Spirit descended like a dove and said, This is my well, my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. He goes immediately by the Spirit into the desert. And God, the Holy Spirit, leads him out for a test drive to demonstrate that indeed he is the Son of God. And if the Son of God was given a test ride to demonstrate that he is, in fact, the Messiah, the Son of God, we also, we're not royalty like Jesus. How much more is our faith going to be test-driven? So faith always is found genuine, as Peter says, through trials. He says your faith, which is more precious than gold, even though it is tried by the fire, brings about genuine salvation. So can unproven, useless, actionless faith save? And the answer, of course, is no. And then he gives two examples of living faith, growing faith. You see, speaking of Father Abraham, who was the first person in that time to really believe in God because everyone else was worshiping the sun and birds and eagles and other goofy things. And God said, walk with me and be my friend. And by faith, he left his family and walked with God and learned about God and became a friend of God. And there's a point. I think it's in Genesis chapter 12, and again, after he offers Isaac, where God says, I'm accounting your faith to you as righteousness. You are not righteous, but I'm putting that to your spiritual bank account. You are now righteous and holy and pure, innocent in my eyes because of your faith. You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. That word complete is the Greek word teleos, which means full-grown. James had t used this word earlier in chapter 1 where he says, if you don't endure trials, you're not going to become teleos, fully grown. And I showed you, uh, I spoke of the analogy of having genetics, but if you don't work out, stretch your muscles and run, you'll never become what you genetically were designed to be. And so is faith. And he says, Abraham had faith, but it became complete, not, not because he offered Isaac, but when he did. It, it demonstrated that the faith that justified him or made him holy and righteous in God's eyes forever, it showed when he was going to offer up Isaac and a host of other things, it showed that his faith was genuine and not just the said faith. He uses Rahab, a woman of the night. And I think it's awesome that the Holy Spirit had him pen that because there are people, well, that's Father Abraham. He's our revered patriarch. Of course, he lived out his faith. But he says even a woman of the night demonstrated real faith and was justified, declared holy and righteous in God's eyes forever when she agreed to help because she really knew that these people were sent by God, and then she acted upon it. So he uses positive examples of what saving faith does. It moves us to action. And Sunday school would be very boring if it was filled with characters and stories, but all you heard was, and they were really convinced that God did it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were in the fiery furnace, and they really agreed that if God wanted to, he could get him out. Or Moses got to the Red Sea and the chariots were coming. But he really believed somehow that God was going to get him out of it. That'd be boring, wouldn't it? Joseph went into jail in Egypt. 
And he really believed that someday God would get him out. And the story ends. Unfortunately, that's where a lot of Christianity ends. I know Jesus is my Savior. I know the Bible. The end. <laughs> so faith that's not lived out is boring and dead. And James is asking, can that faith save? He's not co contradicting the Apostle Paul. Over and over, the Apostle Paul in his writing says, we're saved by grace through faith alone. But James is not questioning the same faith that Paul's talking about. He's questioning these three types of faith. Dead faith, demonic faith, and useless faith. Can that faith save? That's what James is questioning. He's not questioning, questioning the faith that Paul's talking about because Paul would agree with the same things. Paul told his readers over and over, be careful to maintain good works. Even in Ephesians chapter 2, 7 to about verse 9, where Paul specifically says, we are saved by grace through faith alone, not of good works so that no one could boast. For we are God's workmanship saved unto sitting in the pew. Saved unto saying the right things. Saved unto good works which God has prepared for us beforehand that we should walk in them, peripateo, make our lifestyle. So the Apostle Paul would say, Amen, James. Genuine faith gets us moving and grooving. God foreordained that we would walk in good works, but we give the credit to God who's put genuine faith in us. And here's going to be a shocker. Well, let me get to James' examples. James' closing emphatic statements before I say these last things. Two emphatic closing statements. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by dead, demonic, useless, actionless faith alone. Verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Just like a car is useless without an engine. Strong endings. And he's, again, he's talking about those three types of faith. Well, where do you get genuine faith then? Okay, I know I can produce demonic faith, mentally agree, mentally assent. Oh, yeah, that's true, that's true, that's true. I know I can pay God lip service. Yes, I believe in Jesus. The Bible tells me so. But how do I get genuine faith that moves me when everything inside of me wants to shut down and serve myself or be afraid or be angry? How do I get a living faith that gets, gives me guts to get out of my ruts? How do I get genuine faith that gives me repentance it actually changes my heart and makes me alive forever so that I go from seeing that Jesus is not simply an accessory or a family tradition, but the very meaning of life and a real person in my life. Where do I get that from? The bad news is that human beings can't produce that faith. It's a gift. It's a gift. If you have genuine living faith, and you love God and know God and you're alive to God, you're simply not churchy or religious, you're alive to God, God gave you a gift at some point in your life. It could have been over many years through Sunday school and church, and at some moment you just found that you're alive to God and he's the most valuable person in your life. You went from churchiness to genuine Christianity, or it could have happened in a moment, like for me and I think Pastor Bob, where you're just running away from God and all of a sudden God of comes and ushers you out of darkness and makes you alive on the spot. But in either way, it's God's actions. Because apart from God, all a human being could produce are those three types of faith. Demonic faith, um, dead faith, and useless faith. Even the fruits of the Holy Spirit are gifts from God and are distinctive from their non-spiritual counterparts. I know people who d claim not to believe in Jesus and even probably dislike the idea of religion or Christ, and yet they have the fruits. They have some of the, they don't have the fruit of the Spirit, but they have uh, normal v variations. Like, I know people who have kindness, don't know the Lord. You know kind people who don't know the Lord? I know people who have self-control who don't know the Lord. That's, what, that's in the catalog of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But there's a difference between having garden variety self-control and having 
the Holy Spirit's empowering self-control. Two different things, even though they're, they're kind of the same. And it's the same thing with faith. You could have positive thinking and believing the right orthodox truths and paying mental and lip service. Yeah, Jesus is, a, is the Savior, um, this and that and the other. But to have a living faith that sees God, knows God, is hungry for God, the Holy Spirit produces that. And it's a mystery. And the Bible teaches certain things that seem contradictory, but they're both true. For instance, there's a lot of them. Paul says, when I am weak, then I'm what? Strong. Both are true. We believe in one God, but yet he exists in three eternal distinct persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That seems like a contradiction, but it's not. We choose Jesus, but Jesus said, you did not choose me. I chose you. We make free choices, and yet God has chosen us before the foundation of the world, and they're both true, and we have to teach both because the Bible teaches both, even though our limited brains don't get it. And so where does genuine faith come? It comes from the sovereign mercy of God. You hear the gospel, and as you hear the gospel, God in his eternal wisdom and sovereign decision has decided when people hear the gospel, some of them come alive with genuine faith. I remember when I heard the gospel, I came alive somehow, just faith that I've never had. And I always thought I had faith. I was an altar boy. I was religious. But when I heard the gospel, and God allowed me to see it, because I'm sure I heard the gospel many times through my own ears, through my own eyes. But one day God threw in the spiritual lighter fluid, sovereignly. I wasn't even looking for God. I was in a nightclub in Tijuana, in darkness, running away from God. And all of a sudden I just knew I'm not supposed to be living this way. Jesus is real, and I need to serve him. Genuine faith. I went from demonic faith, useless faith, run-of-the-mill self-control, run-of-the-mill kindness, to where actually what Paul really means when he says, if anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all things have become new. So it's, you are a miracle. You are more fortunate than the next lotto winner. You are, you are, and we don't see that. You have a gift that was given to you, and you can't say like Paul says. You can't say, you can't boast about it. He says, we are saved by grace through faith alone, not by works. You can't boast. Like, I just know better than my neighbor. That's why I'm a Christian. I'm just smarter, and I get it that God is real. No, God had to do a million things in your life for you to come to a place where you come alive and are transferred from the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, and you're able to, so to speak, metaphorically, the scales drop. I now see that you're just not a churchy figure, a picture in my family, someone in a book, that's a big old book that's opened all year round, but nobody reads it. You are the very meaning and heartbeat and engine of my life. That is a miraculous gift. God has been so indescribably merciful to me and you that you've been gifted with genuine faith that simply doesn't agree, yeah, Jesus is the Savior. It simply does not just pay lip service or is useless, but you have a faith that's alive forever. Peter says you have been born of eternal seed, eternal genetics, God grafted you into his family. Isn't grace amazing when you really get to see all the different aspects? And that's what will make you say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Jesus said, you know the kingdom of God or genuine faith has come upon you when you're like someone who discovered in a field the most valuable treasure they've ever seen, and they go and sell everything else they have to buy the one treasure. He says, that's when you know the kingdom has come. When you're like that, when you're like, I have found the great pearl of price. I'm going to sell everything I have, metaphorically speaking, because all that really matters now is this field where I've discovered my treasure, Jesus. 
And he's given you that pearl of great price. He's given you faith. And, it can't, and it's not because I'm good or I was smarter, more wise, or I've just always been spiritual. The only answer is God was gracious to me. And he allowed me to come alive. It's very humbling when you look at salvation that way, that it's from start to finish, it's a gift from God. And that does not take away from free choice. It does not. It does not take away from the fact that the Bible teaches we're responsible and accountable for our choices. That's sobering too, huh? We're accountable and responsible for choices we make. And it doesn't contradict, though, that without God's help, all you have spiritually is the wood set up, the charcoal, the tri-tip, but no fire. And that's what religion is. Religion is, you got the tri-tip there, you got the wood and the coals, you might even have the lighter fluid, but you don't have the spark. God, at some point in your life, showed up like he showed up to Lazarus. Come forth! And you came alive. And again, it could have been over several, it could have been a long process over many years. And think, as I get ready to close, think about all the different things God had to do. One, he had to put you in a family, perhaps, where they even taught you to believe in God. God sovereignly took me to a school for about four years where we learned about God every day. Notre Dame school, Catholic school. God did that in his sovereign mercy. Three, he had to bring life lessons into you. He had, allow, he had allow you to go your own way, to get lost so that you could get found. I know God sovereignly allowed me to get my spiritual teeth kicked out and learn crazy lessons so that at one point I could look up and say, I, only God could get me out of this hole that I've dug and I'm in hell. And God had to allow all kinds of different things different personalities. He had allowed different people to show up in your life that were godly examples. You ever had some of those in your life? Where, where, when you weren't serving God, you saw people and you saw Jesus in them. Some people get one, two of those. Some people get none. Some get 50. Some people, we need like 50 people like that to begin to witness to us by the way they live. And then at some moment, the Holy Spirit had to come to you, pull back the blinders, and allow you to see that God is matchless and incomparable worth. And without that, there is no genuine faith. And so James would agree with Paul. We are saved by that kind of faith alone. But can all these three different faiths, useless faith, dead faith, demonic faith, that alone won't save. And I think that's important because in every church, in every crowd, there's always someone that will say, well, thank you for all the advice, James. But I'm... <laughs> I'm just going to hold on to my grace. I'm saved by grace through faith alone, and I really don't need God's wisdom to live by. I really don't need to, to live by the royal law of love. I really don't need to look into the word of God and be a doer of it. And James is like, okay, before you are confident in your little grace license, make sure you got the right validated grace, <laughs> salvation, before you just put that in your wallet and say, I'm, I'm good. So that's what he did for us today. Lord, thank you for your servant James, who many believe was your actual physical brother. Thank you for truth in your word, and thank you for making us alive in Christ and giving us a, a live, genuine faith. And help us to be like Abraham, to obey you and follow you. And help us to be like Rahab in certain ways, where she was willing to be unpopular to side with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, bless those who gave, for your word teaches that giving is a form of worship, a result of faith, and that you loved us so much that you gave your only son, gave him that we might have life, abundantly life here and forever there. And we ask that you guide how we spend this money to expand your work, and influence on the earth, including the war victims in Ukraine. Amen. Amen.
Please stand as we sing Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him all lovely heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's close with this song, the Compassion Hymn. May our faith carry the gospel of peace, even to fields of injustice, to valleys of need. And may our faith bring hope and healing to answer the cries of hungry and helpless with the mercy of Christ. Amen. One, two, three. an everlasting kindness you have used on us when the radiance of heaven came to rescue the lost you called the sheep without a shepherd to leave their distress for your streams of forgiveness and the shade of your rest With compassion for the hurting, you reached out your hand. As the lame ran to meet you, and the dead breathed again, you saw behind the eyes of sorrow, and shared in our tears. With the sigh of the weary, let the children draw near. What boundless love! What fathomless grace you have shown us, O oh God of compassion. Each day we live an offering of praise as we show to the world your Beneath the cross of Calvary and gazed on your face at the thorns of oppression and the wounds of disgrace. You saw the end born of suffering and tarry of grief as you pardoned the suffer and showed grace to the thief. What boundless love! What fathomless grace you have shown us, O so God of compassion. Each day we live and our faith of praise as we show to the world your compassion. Beautiful the feet that carry this gospel of peace To the fields of injustice and the valleys of need To be a voice of hope and healing To answer the cries of the hungry and helpless With the mercy of Christ What boundless love what fathomless grace you have shown us, O God of compassion. Each day we live an offering of grace as we show to the world your compassion.
Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the peace of the Holy Spirit be with all of you as you leave here with a living faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Gospel of peace.